big thank you to the guys at We Are Stoke for sponsoring my match day vlogs this season. You can check them out on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, linked in the description. I hope guys, RESFC here and welcome to episode 6 of the RESFC podcast. I want to say it's episode 6, I think we've had you on three times already, so it must make it episode, episode 6. Um, today we're going to be doing a tier list of Stoke City managers past and present. We're joined again by the Barefoot TV's Elliot Yates. Um, he did a very good live stream the other day with the local boxer Nathan Heaney. Um, so yeah, today we are going to be ranking Stoke City managers past and present, as I've just said. Um, but yeah, before we get going, we've got a couple of bits to clear up. A bit of Stoke news. The absolute, um, what's the word? Bottle. Yeah. We had. Go on. Uh, no, no, no. I'll let you speak. Go on. We had the biggest bottle of the century. Um, if you don't already know, I was representing Stoke in the We Are Stoke FIFA tournament. Uh, I'll just let you go and check out yesterday's video if you want to go and see that. Because, uh, yeah. I prefer not to speak. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, last week. Uh, we brushed on it last week with Project Restart, but the Bundesliga uh, returned last week. And what did you think? I think it was a bit overhyped from what people were making it out to be. I think you, I don't really find football entertaining without a crowd there because you know maybe if it's like local football, my mates, yeah, that's fine. But like they're my mates and stuff. Where it's just lo- where it's just football in another country, no crowd, no sort of excitement you can really get. It, I just don't really like it, and I think uh, I think the football leagues in England need to take a heads up about that and see what what can we do. As in, are we going to get like the revenue coming in? Because obviously they are, and like that match against Dortmund, well Dortmund Schalke was a record ever for like viewing figures, and that's going to make so much money. But is it about the money realistically? It should be concerning people's safety. And even that thing yeah. yesterday with the relegation that came out saying that EFL clubs will be relegated no matter what happens. I just think to myself, like, a relegation is the last thing that someone like a Tranmere Rovers or a Bolton Wanderers mm. need right now, and particularly in their financial states. And I don't think there's much support from the EFL at all. I think it's just so they can make money for themselves in their back pocket. Yeah. Um, I watched the Schalke versus Dort- well, Dortmund versus Schalke game. Yeah, yeah, and then I had a game on in the background. I had the five thirty game on in the background, and yeah, didn't even bother with the uh, Bayern Munich match on the Sunday. Um, but tonight, I don't know whether I'm going to bother watching the Berlin derby. I, it's getting to that point now. I'm not going to bother. I'm just re- I'm just rewatching um, Euro '96 at the moment, and I'm really enjoying that. I think. Mm. I think because I never got to experience Euro '96, it, you know, I think that sort of makes me sort of experience it, not in the same way, but like no. just a, just a little bit of it because like everyone's sort of doing it now. I think that's the main thing with with me that I'm doing. I watch the because um, um, everyone sort of adopted a German club now. I'm adopting Mainz, and I watch their game. I watch only watch the highlights of it because they weren't on a live stream on my sort of channels. And even then, I just thought to myself, Am I really bothered or? You know, it's. I'm probably going to watch the Schalke game on Sunday, but I'm not going to pay full attention. I'll have it on in the background whilst I'm doing some college work or something. Um, don't want that to come to the championship. No, me neither. No, not a fan. Uh, if the championship does come back, though, I have said this. I will be doing a live watch along thing for the games uh, that Stoke play I have said that for a while I'm sure Elliot would be willing to join for a few if he wants to oh yeah, yeah definitely if he can get the game on he's more than welcome to come on um, you heard it here first guys heard it here first um, but yeah that's the plan I'm going to th- sort of do a live watch along thing and then um, maybe get a bit of viewer interaction at the end sort of praise and grumble style but we're not going to call it praise and grumble we'll call it, you know, we're going to call it grumble and praise because you know, creativity um, but yeah today we're going to be ranking Stoke City managers um, from 1970 onwards 
Yes. So, you think of Stoke in the 70s, who do you think of? Tony Waddington. Where, right. So, he managed 825 games and got a 35.27 win percentage, I think. That's what it said on too, Google. I'm not too sure on that stat. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll go with it. Um, that's what it said on Google. Um, he won the 1972 League Cup and he managed one of our greatest ever squads. The you greatest know, ever squad. One of the greatest ever squads. But you can call it, we'll call it the greatest ever squad. You know, we had the likes of Banks, Marsh, um, off the Conroy. top of the Green off and all of them. The, you know, that 72 squad in the nine, in that 1972 squad. Where have you put Tony Waddington, Elliot? I'll put him. So we're going to do uh, five tiers today. Oh. We're going to do a God tier. We're going to do God tier, good tier, okay tier, not great and awful. And obviously, big Tony has to go in the God tier for what he's done for the club. Like, only major honour in our history. Um, what You can even count the Watney Cup, I guess, because that was sort of big at the time. Yeah. But obviously, it's not big now. What else? He, he bought Gordon Banks. Brought Stanley Matthews back, um, yeah. got us into the UEFA Cup. We played Ajax, you know, for a club. You're taking a, a club like Stoke from Division Two to go and play Ajax in the UEFA Cup is yeah. just astounding, really, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm hoping the manager we've got now can take us from Division Two to playing in Europe against the likes of Ajax. Only time will tell, but yeah, Tony Waddington has got to go in that God tier. There, he could have his own tier. He could genuinely have his own tier because of what yeah. he did for us. Um, but yeah, Tony Waddington, God tier. We're going to try and include some from multiple decades. We obviously weren't around in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s. So some of the facts may not be 110% accurate, but we're trying our best. When we get to the more recent managers like Pulis, Lambert, Hughes, Rowett, Jones, etc., you know, it'll be because we've actually experienced it. But the next one, we're going to go for Mick Mills. Well, I didn't really know too much about Mick Mills until actually you mentioned him. And I've done a little bit of research on him. And um, he brought through Steve Bowles, I believe. And he went on to be the club's youngest ever captain. He's in a lot, not really at Stoke, but like for other clubs as well. Yeah. Lee Dixon's another one, Mark Chamberlain. So I think that era was sort of a good era. But then it sort of curtailed off when Lee Dixon was sold, Steve Ball was sold, Mark Chamberlain were all sold. You know, both yeah. two to Arsenal, one to Portsmouth. I just think after that, there wasn't really... I think it was a bit of a dark era. Like, if you were asked to name a player in Stoke side out of yeah. that 80s era post-Chamberlain, and I don't think many fans like from our era could because, you know, there's there was such a bad time going on there. yeah. No, you don't really hear about any of the '80s players anymore. It's no. it's only really the '60s, well, fifth, yeah, '60s, '70s, '90s. We, Night, yeah, it's you don't hear anything about the 1980s because we didn't really do much. And Mark Chamberlain was probably our best player in the 1980s. I'd probably yeah. have to say, um, but yeah, Mick Mills. 214 games, a 34.11 win percentage. I'm going to put him in OK. Yeah, I'll put him in OK as well. I think um, that'll be probably not the best manager, not the worst manager, just in the middle. Yeah. Next, um, we're starting to get into the more modern era now. We're only three in and we're getting into the modern era. Um, next up, we're going to go for Lou Macari. He had two spells through the 90s. Um, his first spell was between 1991 and 1993. Uh, he managed two, 122 games and a 46.72 win percentage. And in his second spell between 1994 and 1997, he uh, managed 144 games with a win percentage of 36.81. Some decent stats there. And obviously, we did win the Auto Glass Shield twice under him. Not like anyone knows that, though, anyway. We've won no, we, 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 we don't sing a song about it. We or hardly anything. mention it. You know, if, if I didn't bring that up, no one would have known. Um, but no, Lou Macari managed some great players through in the 90s. You're thinking of the likes of Mark Steen um, as one that 
probably most young Stokies in the 90s looked up to. And Nello. You know, star striker, scoring the goals, and we cannot forget Nello, the kit man. And if you, I know you, if you're from Stoke, you've probably seen the film, but if you haven't seen the film Marvellous, go and check it out. It is a great film. Yeah, definitely. Alex Ferguson actually quoted that, said it's the best football film he's ever seen. So um, It is a great anyone, film. Anyone who's not a Stoke fan, if someone like that says that, then you have to check it out. Yeah. Um, I'll prob- If I can find it on Amazon or something, I'll leave it in the description. God. Some of the stuff I'll link in the description. <laughs> I'm going to be linking DVDs now in the description. No, but yeah. Go and check out Marvelous. It's a great film. But we're talking about Lou Macari. He had two spells and two very good spells. I'm going to put him in good. I've put him in good as well. I was sort of caught between picking him in the good or God tier. The only reason I got with him in the good tier was because the um, you'll see who my next manager is, but Waddington, you've already know, is in there. He's done it at a top level. I think yeah. he's done it with the um, European. He's done it with the League Cup. And I think Macari was really good with the side that he had, but I think it it wasn't a great side in terms of like compared to that seventy two era. Um, I think with Macari, you've got the All Glass Trophy is not really a massive trophy to win. It's still a good achievement to a club like Stoke, but it quote wasn't me, a quote big me. One to win. Is the yeah. the All Glass Shield is the equivalent to the Johnson's Paint Trophy now, isn't it? While the Leasing dot com <laughs> trophy, it's what that is. <laughs> I think so, yes, I think so. I think they play, it may be something completely different. Like, I mean, this is our generation. If mm. like you're 50 years old or above, or but sorry to quote people's ages out, but if you're in an older generation, then leave us a comment and just like let us know sort of what's yeah. it equivalent to now. Yeah. Um, but to win two trophies, it's, it's a very good achievement. You know, no Stoke manager has ever won two trophies. Um, and I want to say we got a promotion under him. Um, did we get promotion from the third tier to the second? I want to say we got promotion under him. I want to say that as well. I know we were very close. I remember the um, Autoglass Trophy when we won it um, the first time was a yeah. bit sort of mixed emotions because they missed out on the playoffs. So I don't think they got promoted him in under that season to like get to Division 1, but they've definitely, I think they have got promoted under him. Yeah, it's not, obviously we weren't around in that time. Um, so we're not 100% sure. But we're getting on to sort of the late 90s, early 2000s now. Uh, we've put um, Lou Macari in the good tier. Next up, Chris Kamara. You know, absolutely know. outstanding record of a 7.14 win percentage. Yeah. yeah great. Now, um, Chris Kamara, you think of him now more Soccer Saturday... You know, I don't know, Jeff, you know, sort of thing. And he sort of was that sort of manager. He, uh, I wasn't around in those times, but apparently it did get really toxic under Kamara. Um, 14 games, one win, that's a very poor record. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think my dad, when my dad was talking about Kamara, I sort of looked back at it and I think it's similar to Jones in a way because he said mm. Kamara was always somebody who'd be like G in the crowd up. And you see that with Nathan Jones as well. I think it was almost sort of like a desperation of him to like keep his job or something. Yeah. So you could sort of see like the two links there. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, I think he just needs to um, stick to his um, punditry and, uh, well, punditry. <laughs> but um, I think he needs to like stick to Soccer Saturday right now because I think. That's the only chance he's got to get a job in football at the moment. Yeah, um, there's nothing really much left to say about Chris Kamara. Um, yeah, <laughs> must have been good to get that one win. Um, yes. Next up is Gujan Thorson. I think that's how it's Gujan pronounced. Gujan Thorson. Gujan Thorson. Thorson. Um, I'm going to put him in good. I'm putting him in good as well. I think so. Um, and don't quote me if I'm wrong, but I think he was the manager that like got us to Cardiff in the uh, when we beat Brentford. I yeah. think, but I know we yeah, definitely won against yeah, and um, we won against um, Cardiff City at Ninian Park, and I think that was brilliant for the whole club because um, they took away Graham Cavanagh, they took away Peter Thorne, and they yeah. were almost like trying to sort of buy the league. And when you know O'Connor scored, I think 
it was brilliant for every Stoke fan. So I think he holds a special place in every Stoke fan's heart because of that. Yeah, and not only did he get a promotion, he has got the best win percentage of anyone on this list at the moment. We're not counting uh, caretaker managers. We're not counting uh, yeah, caretaker interims. We're not counting other ones that we perhaps might not have known from the very early 1900s. Yeah, so yeah, already 150, yeah. Uh, 154 games, a uh, 50% win rate record. That is very good for a manager. That is very good. Yeah, very, very good indeed. And I have put him in good because, like, I know Waddington's got a um, less win percent record, but, like, he was in a higher tier, like, in terms yeah. of... Yeah, but not well. only so that... I think it's a lot harder. Not only that, he did manage... Coming well, just over eight hundred games for us um, did Waddo. Yeah. So, you know, and that doesn't count draws. So if you're thinking about a loss percentage, I'd probably say it's about thirty something. I know it was quite evenly spread between wins, draws, and losses. I yeah. think he was. I think he was positive though. I think he. Uh, this is Thorson. No, I'm on about um, Waddo. I think he had more. Oh yeah, yeah. Draws. And wins than losses, so that's a decent record. Next, yeah. we are moving on very quickly. Um, but I think we're going to have a lot more to talk about with these managers coming up. Um, we have skipped over the older ma- older managers purely because I'm 16, Elliot's 18, and we, we weren't around in those days. So it's purely impossible to talk. And we can do as much research as we want, but you know, you're not going to be able to talk about it unless you've got a fan that w- was around in those days. Um, so next up, we've gone for Tony Pulis. Two spells at the club. His first spell uh, was between 2003 and 2005, I want to say. Uh, 131 yeah. games with a 35.88 win percentage. His second spell was between 2006 and... I want to say, and 2013, 333 games with a 36.64 win percentage. Yeah. If you're talking win percentages, it's very good. You know, it is in his second spell. Well, both spells, it's better than Waddo's, but obviously the first spell was in a lower division. The second spell was very good because, you know, we took at that point, we'd have done five years in the Premier League. Four or five yeah, years, yeah. Prem. Um, obviously, got us promoted, uh, got us to an FA Cup final, uh, got us to Europa League. Uh, I know you're going to be able to talk more on this, um, but yeah, what a manager Tony Pulis was. Yeah, yeah, and he does divide opinion, and I can understand that. I think in his last season, particularly, that was emphasised a lot. I think we just got tired of this football being played, and I was there. I mean. It was sometimes it was like watching paint dry, you know. Yeah. Just it wasn't a lot of excitement going on in that last year, particularly. I think there was links with him coming back, obviously when we sat Nathan Jones, and he would have kept us up. But I think the atmosphere would have been very toxic. And if mm. he had have come back, I think he'd be probably lower down on this list, as that would that would have been his third stint as a manager. And I think like, you've already cemented your legacy. Just, just, just leave don't, it as it is. Don't tarnish anything by yeah. sending us down to League One. Um, but no, Tony Pulis, from what I've heard, a very good manager. I didn't go to any games under Tony Pulis. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you could say that. Um, but what he's done for the club, you know, you hear the stories about Wembley, about promotion. People were tipping us to get relegated in that first season back, in that yeah. first season up. And he kept us there for five years under his reign, and then obviously Hughes. We'll get onto him in a minute, but we managed to stay there for 10 years and he built a really solid side. You know, you look at Delap, Whelan, Walters, look at Shawcross and Hooth uh, with Wilco and Sorensen. You know, a great squad we used to have under Tony Pulis. I've put him in God's ear. Yeah, I'm, I've done the same. Basically, if your name's Tony and you come to manage Stoke, you're going to do well. Yeah, basically, we've only had Tonys in God's tier, so uh, that's about as good as it gets, really. Yeah, um, would you have wanted him back um, when no. when uh, Jones got sacked? 
No. No, I don't think so, because I think everyone sort of got tired with it. My dad said to me personally, he just said that if Tony Pulis comes back, I'm I'm not going because yeah. like, I don't want I want to go to a football match. I want to have excitement, and it was good at first. Like he was the first manager um, of me supporting supporting Stoke, and he was good at first and sort of like getting the team up and running and everything. There's stuff like everyone remembers um, Tony Pulis' memories. And then um, you're going to cast your mind back to that Aston Villa match. Um, his mother yeah. passed away on the same day, and the lift he gave everyone when he came back and we won 2-1. I think he was good in that and I think he just sort of lost his lost his touch in a way with Stoke in particular with this whole playing style. And you can see that with every club he's gone to. You've seen it at West Brom, you've seen it yeah. at Crystal Palace. The owners didn't really like it and it wins games and it keeps you up, but you it's know, not the majority, pretty. it's not pretty, yeah. Win, win ugly is what they say. And he took that to a, a whole new level. Um, but no, if he was to come back when Jones got sacked, um, I'd have backed him. You know, yeah. but I think where we were at the time, you know, bottom of the championship, it was not the time to have a split fan base. I think it would have been no. a gamble. It could have paid off, but we, we'll never know. But I think we may have stroked, uh, striked lucky under O'Neill. Um, but yeah, Tony Pulis, God tier for what he did. Next up, Mark Hughes. Another one that provides opinion. Yeah, but I'd have put him God tier up until 2016. Yeah, I'm the same. Up to, I'm the, the, same. Up to the final third place finish, that summer 2016, he'd have been God tier. Yeah. But after that, awful, awful season. We had... Such a great squad in that. On paper, we had a great squad in that relegation season. Yeah. But obviously, so. that's not how football works. You can buy as many good players as you want. It doesn't always work. Uh, but we're going to throw back to 2013-14. First ninth place finish. Record in the Premier League. Brought in some great players like Um In the next Odin season. Wingy. Odin Wingy as well. He was, he was an absolute baller. Uh, ne- uh, the next season he bought in Bojan season after he bought in Shakiri. so you can see the sort of um, direction he wanted to go but then everything sort of turned after that um, penalty, sh- penalty shootout loss I, personally, I, think I, think, was... I think that's where this whole decline we've been on has started I don't think that's where it sort of escalated from I think that had a factor to play in it I think the where it escalated from was when we signed in Bula. Yeah, I think I that's think... where it happened because we played quite well after that League Cup semi final. Like I think we got wins against um, who do we, we def I can't remember. I'll have to um, look it up and or you'll have to tell me in the comments. But we definitely got a few wins straight after that, and I thought, okay, well we've bounced back from this. We're going to be all right. Yeah. And I think what happened afterwards was when we signed in Bula. We played brilliant for the first three games he was in it, but then we sort of dismantled that sort of core that we tried to build the season on with the Bojan on Outovic and Shakiri. Yeah. He took Bojan out the side and he put in Apolai just further forward. He put yeah. in Bula in there to try and replace Enzonzi. And it's just, it wasn't going, it really wasn't going to work after that sort of three games he had. I think there was rumours that he'd um, had an offer from Juventus and maybe his head was sort of tipped then and he didn't try, but apparently that wasn't the case as from the first day, Glenn Johnson and Shea Given have said, couldn't care less, didn't turn up to English lessons. And if Bojan's looking at that and thinking, how's, how's he getting in ahead of me? Then you are yeah. going to feel demotivated as a player. The th- the, yeah, the thing you've just mentioned about the English lessons, I think that's really poor. Uh, I know this isn't a podcast about Ginelli and Bula, but if, if I'm going to go and play in, where can I not speak the language? Portugal. I can't speak Portuguese. If I went to play for Porto, you know, I'd at least try to learn, you know, at least yeah. the basics, you know, please, thank you, hello, goodbye, whatever. Um, yeah. And I think that's sort of where Hughes was a, a master of his own downfall. Um, the whole attitude problem. Um, had yeah. we not had that attitude problem, what a squad we'd have had. Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. 
Um, I think his biggest downfall was not leaving after that 16, 17 season. I think, yeah. that, I think, I think if he, he probably would have been in like the good tier after, we would have held him in a lot higher esteem after that. But I think had he gone in that after that 16, 17 season, we had that blip. If we'd have got somebody in who's can organise a squad and can make a squad good, like I can't really think of one off the top of my head. But if we'd have got someone in like that, I think Sean Dyche. We we um, maybe Sean Dyche, because, but I think because he promote, yeah. The reason why I'd have said Sean Dyche that summer was because uh, he'd have just got no, he'd have just done his first season with Burnley. He was out of contract. And yeah. I think he'd have suited our squad uh, fairly well and don't think we'd have got rid of Whelan and Walters. Um, and then, obviously, a couple of other people that were out of contract in that summer 2017. Uh, to the, summer 2017, right. I've, right, I've just got my train of thought back. Um, so, you'd have players like Andy Robertson that we could have got. We could have got the likes of Harry Maguire. Um, yeah. Could have got Matisse de Ligt that summer. Yeah. You know, we're talking some massive names. They might not have been the biggest names back then. But I think just the sort of decision-making with the recruitment, I'm not sure it was there. Um, no. I know it was sort of Mark Cartwright that made the uh, transfer decisions. But under under Hughes, we had the potential, but unfortunately never, never really materialised, which was a no. crying shame because look where we could have been. Now, we would well. We wouldn't be in this mess in the championship. Uh, we'd have definitely stayed up. Literally, yeah, at least stayed up, and you could have even said qualify for Europe at that point. I was predicting us to, you know, push for you. Do sort of what Burnley did that season. You know, they were up there that season, and um, well, you'd, you'd sort of expect us and Burnley to have been flipped that season. Looking at the squads that we had, um, you know. Burnley were playing the likes of Ashley Barnes, not the best player, and they somehow no. qualified for Europe. Uh, no, I we think had, with the formation we had Jordan, as well. We had Jordan Shakiri and Hesse Rodriguez on paper, superstars. Was, yeah, they are really world class players, and we somehow got relegated. Yeah, I was really excited going into that season because we basically said we're going to play this formation. And we'd all seen Juf at right back and we thought, well, we're going to play him at right wing back. We thought, brilliant. Like, you know, we know Juf can play, do a good job there. He can do a good job anywhere. And then we signed Kevin Vimmer for 18 mil. And I thought, oh, brilliant. A player from Tottenham. Like, he's not going to Tottenham's team, but he must be good. And then you think, ah, that's why he didn't get to Tottenham's team. And then, you know, it just was a massive decline. And that foundation that Pulis built upon, even though Pulis playing five at the back sometimes, and yeah. they were pretty much all centre-backs at the back, you'd think, well, at least we're not conceding any goals. So that's three at the back. We did leak a lot of goals. And as soon as you realise this doesn't work, OK, what do we do now? Yeah, I know that 17-18 season was just painful. Um, I think going into Christmas, I want to say we won three games. I want to say three, three or four games going into Christmas. Yeah. It would have been Arsenal, Southampton, Watford, Swansea, West Brom. Well, I think was Watford the only game we won away that season other than the last day? Yes, we had two away wins that season and it was against Watford and Swansea on the last day. But Swansea were dead and buried that last... That's the most painful thing. We could have stayed up had we just held on, or you know, put a couple of easy chances away in previous weeks. You know, we had some glorious chances. Um, I think Manjuf was just really low on confidence. And yeah, I remember that I one against think, Tottenham. The one where he just skied it from about four yards out. Yeah, it wasn't the, probably the best place to be playing with low confidence. Um, but the the thing you can't fault man if he does give it a good go every week. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think it's really fair on him to sort of like give him stick when there's no one in that dressing room other than maybe Ryan Shawcross to say like, no, just keep going, mate, keep going. Whereas you've got all those heads like your Glenn Whelans, your John Walters, even even Steve Sidwell or someone like yeah. that just saying like, it's all right, mate, keep it going. Like these experienced players. And we had we didn't have a lot of them. We didn't have anyone who be a leader in that squad other than Ryan Shawcross or Darren Joe Allen. 
Darren Fletcher? Maybe, I don't... We have, like, Darren Fletcher, Charlie Adam. Apparently, yeah, apparently uh, Darren Fletcher was quite quiet, so I don't know if he'd really be that sort of one to sort of, like, be G'ing people up. The thing thing that still baffles me to this day about this season, and I know we've spoke quite in detail about Mark Hughes, and I did say we'd do this with these later managers, um, how we managed to get relegated with the most amount of Champions League winners' medals in our squad. Yeah. You know, all we needed was a, maybe a different player up front. Maybe we could have gone for something really similar to the Stoke Lona days where we pulled, pulled Bojan back to a false nine. Yeah, I, think, we could I have, couldn't even we could understand Bo- why we loaned him. Lambert was really, really wanting to bring like, Bojan back from loan. We could have played him at false nine. We could have had Shaq on the right, Hesse on the left. What a front three that would be. A great oh, nice. front three, but unfortunately... Another player that didn't really get along with the manager, Pesce Rodriguez, unfortunately. You know, gave us that yeah. great win against Arsenal, but didn't really do anything after. No, and he hasn't done anything after his other clubs either, so you can sort no. of see why he hasn't done anything after. No, um, I don't know whether we've mentioned it, but I've put Mark Hughes in OK. I I'll put, put him, him in. in a, I'll put him in OK. I think he divides opinion very much so. I think you have to sort of cast your mind back to that, what you can do with a Pulis side where you can add flair to it. That's brilliant. When he gets in his own side, it's not great. So there'd be two There'd be two sort of Mark Hughes I'd put in. So the Mark Hughes from 2013 to 2016, God tier. The Mark Hughes from 2017 to 2018, awful. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more with you there. Next, Speaking of that 17-18 season, haven't we spoken enough about it? Paul Lambert, 15 games, uh, two wins against Huddersfield and Swansea on the last day. Uh, 13.33 recurring uh, percent- win percentage. I added, put that one in a calculator. Uh, Paul Lambert, I've gone for not great. Mm, it was a bit of a panic appointment, I felt. Um, yeah. We were linked. I think we were dead certain that we were going to get um, Kike Sanchez Flores, yeah. and that did not work out. And we thought, I think oh, no, every, who are we I think, get? I think every Stoke fan would have put a fiver on it at the time. Yeah, I think it was, everyone would have put a fiver on it. I think so as well. I think we were looking at managers that are sort of not being sacked because, like, who can you get from that pool of managers and who played and who have managed in the Premier League? And have not been sat yet. I mean, we I think we were just a bit too late with Sam Allardyce. Yeah. Uh, with that, I think um, if we, sort of... I think if Hughes had gone after maybe Bournemouth or the seven two at uh, City, I think we, I'd have gone from someone like uh, Sam Allardyce. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I completely. He was at Everton at that point though, so I think. Um, I know. No, no, no. no. Yeah. The Everton appointed him late November. The seven two and the Bournemouth like were in. Oh yeah, yeah. no, n- no. Um, if we'd have sacked Hughes after the seven two, I'd have definitely gone for Allardyce because Everton wouldn't have picked him up at that point. But that season was too late for Allardyce, and we ended up with Paul Lambert and relegated. Um, yeah, not great, Paul Lambert. Yeah, not great. I did feel sorry for him though because he did try his best. It just, it, it, he's trying to. I don't. I did. I don't even think he was the man to get us out of the championship as well. I thought Rowett would have been better for that. Yeah, I think. But I think most Stokies, when Rowett went, would have thought, "Oh, we should have just kept Lambert." But I think if you look at what Lambert's done with Ipswich this season, I don't think we would have got no. come out of the championship. Yeah. Right. Speaking of Gary Rowett, I've put Paul Lambert in not great. I don't know whether we've touched on it. Um, I think Elliot, you've put him in not great as well. I think some no, of these have been. Great. I think I think we've been dead on the same. Um, but next, Gary Rowett. Yeah, I think it, I, I want to say it was like two years ago to the day we appointed him. Uh, I saw someone put it on Twitter this morning, or Facebook, I think. Um, but yeah, two two years ago to the day we appointed him, I think most people thought we were going to absolutely walk the league. Yeah. I we think, thought, um, yeah, we've got a Premier we League thought, squad in the Championship. Oh, how hard could this be? Yeah. Um, 
I think that's a lot of things with most Stoke fans, though, because I was one of those fans who thought Championship is a tin pot league. This will be nice for a season, and then we'll just go back up again. And wasn't that way at all. Gary Rowett, proven Championship manager. But it's the same thing again. It's attitude. It's always been that. And that's we looked brilliant enough. against we looked brilliant against Walsall in pre season, and then we didn't look great afterwards. And then we played like first league game, and I see we I played league. Fifth... Everyone's go go on. I think the thing that uh, not pitmaster the downfall, but added fuel to the fire almost was Leeds away first game, the most difficult game of the season. I personally think going to Ellen Road. First game of the season, they're all packed out because they won't go see Bielsa's new team. Um, Ellen Road packed on the opening day is harder than a cold Tuesday night at a pack Stoke. That's personally my opinion. And I think, had we have got a first home game, if we'd have got that first game at home, even if it was like Brentford at home the first game and Leeds away the second game, I think we'd have been in a much stronger position because Brentford, you, you'd almost think a bottom half team, but some of the football they can play is brilliant. Um, and I think had we have not played Leeds first game, I think we'd have we'd have been in a completely different position. But yeah, fixtures fixtures are fixtures, and you can't you can't decide who you play. Um, I think the Spygate I think the Spygate thing had a little bit on that as well because like he said, oh, I've done this with every team. Don't worry. I think us not knowing that, we just thought, oh, we're awful. Like Leeds can out tactic us, and Le- we didn't know that Leeds were going to be like pushing where they were. Like we always thought of Leeds as sort of like mid table, sort of push the playoffs. Yeah, but they weren't. And, and I saw people saying, oh, three one Stoke. Like Stoke going to win three nil today. Like just really confident going into the match, mm-hmm. and then straight after that match, everyone was just like, well, we'll be lucky to get a draw from Brentford. Yeah, and a draw we got. Um... But yeah, Gary Howard, some of the signings he made weren't great. Um, no. it's, so it's the whole but, thing as well with Bojan as well. Like, remember the whole thing with Bojan as well? Like, Bojan, um, Bauer. He shouldn't have said it. I mean, yeah. Bauer, I can sort of understand because he's gone to another club and he's had an attitude problem there. Uh, so I can understand Moritz Bauer's, like, why he'd left Moritz Bauer out. I think there was some, there was a lot more attitude problems there that we tried to sort of crease, the, crease them over, but it was going to take yeah. at least sort of three years to do. And we're well, in that sort of third year coming up. When we when did you turn to sort of the Rowett Out Brigade? I've always... Because uh, I'd, really I'd backed him from the start, but after his comments at Bolton about the, oh, why don't you sing for Rory to lap? You know, he's had a pop at my fellow Stoke fans there and I, I don't yeah. really want that from a manager. That's personally when yeah. I turned. I think I started to turn, I think probably about, I remember we left Bojan out of the squad. And I'm not saying this because I love Bojan. I really do love him. And he's someone like, you know. But I remember we left Bojan out of the squad at Derby. And um, I thought, when Bojan's played, he's been our best player. Why are we leaving him out? And I think it was sort of like that sort of row. It's sort of like, oh, I'd rather win with my, uh, I'd rather lose with my ideas than like win with someone someone else's sort of. Yeah. Things and I think leaving Bojan out was a massive, like, sort of confidence bridge. So I think that's when I started to turn when he started leaving Bojan out because it yeah, wasn't thing, to him thing, rather than for the team. But yeah, Rowett 29 games, 31 wins, not great for, no, for the I'll championship favourites. Awful, yeah. Next up, <sighs> the man that everyone wanted to succeed at the club. Every, I don't think when he came in, everyone basically, basically everyone apart from Luton fans wanted him to do well. Yeah, um, and Vale fans. Oh, of course, the Vale fans as well. You know, the obsessed bunch of uh, people they are. Um, yeah, Nathan Jones, thirty-eight games, a fifteen point eight win percentage. You know, we thought we were onto something after Leeds when we beat them uh, in January. Uh, last year, we thought we were onto something. You know, we just beaten Marcelo Bielsa's Leeds um, because that's basically what you called them last year. Um, same as Wayne Rooney's Derby County this year. Um, yeah, we thought we were onto something after Leeds. Um, sort of spiralled a bit downhill after that. Then we got that win at Blackburn. 
Um, and we were playing some pretty decent football at Blackburn. Uh, play, started playing some more right football going into the end of the season. Um, and you're thinking, yeah, playoffs. Playoffs with his, with his players who can play the system. Playoffs. Yeah. I, I, sort I, of, I said I predicted fourth this year. I sort of, like in his first stint, I thought brilliant. Um, because not because we were win, weren't winning a load of games, because he was bringing a lot of young players through. Like, when you looked at, like, Nathan Collins was coming through, uh, Tom Edwards was coming through. Um, yeah. Who else was there as well? Uh, the Linden he brought in. Yeah, the Linden as well. I think I could give him a sort of leniency for that because it was almost like a pre-season for the pre-season. Yeah. I know, I know and, we um, touched on this. Um, when was it? Season review, it might have been. First episode oh, season review. I know you yeah. mentioned about pre-season for the pre-season. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what he was trying to implement. But I just think we didn't. The only youngster I'd say who didn't really get in there was Tyrese Campbell because he went on loan. I think that was a massive mistake. I think so as well. I, he was brilliant against Leeds, wasn't he? Uh, Shrewsbury was the one. The Shrewsbury replay was where he got those two goals two early goals, on. Yeah. Um, I looked. At, yeah, because I looked at that and I thought, why are we doing that? And I think he made. I don't know if he's had a vendetta against Campbell because he, we just he, didn't play him even in that second season. He played him in pre-season, and he had an an outstanding pre-season. Any pre-season. player and that did, scores then didn't a, play him. Then first game of the season, I think most people would have been sensible to maybe predict Vokes and Campbell. And then yeah. first day of the season, you look at the team sheet, and you see Benic Phoebe. We've been playing Campbell and Vokes most of pre-season. Well, well yeah. Campbell and Gregory, for, we did the 40, 45 minutes swap, didn't we? I'm yeah. not a big fan of that. Um, I know at Wrexham we played Campbell and Gregory for the first half. Then we played... Um, second half we played Vokes and the Vokes. Uh, that was my only pre-season game I went to, so I'm not 100% sure what, you know... what. What else happened? Um, yeah, I but, don't know if he has. So, I don't know if it's just like a vendetta against him because we just he played brilliant. He couldn't have done anything better. Just perfect preseason for the him. The only thing that and I he think gets dropped could... the first game. Same with Tiba Belinden. I don't know why we put him on loan to Bolton. He can easily get in our first team. Yeah, I think the thing with Tyrus Campbell, and I noticed it a little bit in preseason. It just his stamina. I think that's the only thing Nathan Jones said he needs to work on. And I think O'Neill's. But, spotted it as well it's just his stamina but to be but honest surely that comes with games exactly you know and it's the same with Belinda I'm genuinely baffled to why he was loaned out um because I know he, there was links go you know when the day when Bolton made like eight signings and Belinda was one of them um I know there have been links throughout that day it was literally you'd woken up to see that Valinden's going to Bolton and you're like, well, why? You know, yeah. he wants two in every position. We've got two in... But he we've doesn't got, play we've got a formation two, with wingers. No, we've got two in every position. He'd been playing him at Cam in pre-season, a free-roaming Cam like, like Tom Ince was. He'd been playing yeah, a free-roaming Cam it, like Tom Ince was. It sort and of then, goes back to the same thing I said about Gary Rowett, like um, succeeding with, like failing with your own ideas rather than succeeding mm-hmm. with someone else's. He was obsessed with the diamond formation. He went to Birmingham, played a 4-3-3, did great, unlucky to lose the game, then go straight back to the diamond. The only reason why we lost to Birmingham was because substitutions were wrong. Yeah. Substitutions were wrong. We failed to pick Zhukovic out at the back post, which... I think if you're playing against Birmingham or Bristol City, as we'll come on to in a second, um, Zhukovic and Jeju... Defending the back post are, is the main problem. They jump very high at the back stick and win things and put it in. Why yeah. was no one marking Because I watched it back the other day. No one's marking him. You're letting Zhukovic at the back stick. That's the only thing I didn't get. Substitution was slightly off, I think. I think I did say in the outro, I said, I think it was like Hogan came on far too late. Campbell came on far too late. Allen had that really good chance. Probably should have been put away. It's a winnable game. You know, Bellingham's goal was a fluke. Yeah, I'm not going to say great. that to be salty. It it took the biggest deflection I've ever seen off Lindsay and nothing Federici could have done. Um, 
But yeah, unfortunately, Nathan Jones just didn't work out. No, it's a confidence thing as well. Like, look at the confidence so many people have got back now. Like, yeah. Nick Powell, I don't know what he did under him. Jack Butland's another one. Joe Allen's another one. Yeah. Tom Ince is playing this position. I mean, people still not don't really like Tom Ince, and, but he's really trying his hardest now, and I've seen that in games. Yeah. James McLean's another one. He's been outstanding on throwing. Tommy him. Smith is another one. Smith is... I'm sorry. Tommy Smith is underrated. Whether people like it or not, Tommy Smith is underrated. Oh, he doesn't... Yeah. He puts a shift in. He can overlap and can put a brilliant ball in. I love Tommy Smith. He yeah. is brilliant, and people need to see that Tommy Smith is a very good player. On that right hand side with Tom Ince, especially at the whole game, at the Charlton game, you know, some couple of the recent home games, he's been outstanding on that yeah. right hand side. People... I think what helped that was that they played against the, with each other at Huddersfield. I think they've got that sort of yeah. connection. They already know what each other's going to do. Yeah, Tom Ince. Uh, no, it'll be. Uh, Butland or Bart to Smith. Smith will drive it up the pitch a little bit, play it um, to Ince. Ince will do a couple of step overs, whatever he likes to do. Cuts in a bit. Smith's making that overlapping run. Um, Ince will find him. Smith will put ball in. Goal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Campbell. You saw that with um, the whole maps, didn't you? The last game yeah. I played. You saw that with Powell, didn't you? Powell, yeah, that, that's the piece of play I was describing because that's you know what happens. We on, down that right hand side, we are deadly. I don't think yeah. we was potent going forward on that left hand side purely because because uh, Martin Zindi's not a left back. Martin Zindi isn't a left back, and some of his deliveries aren't great. McLean's deliveries are very good across the floor. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll move on to O'Neill now as we've been talking about O'Neill's piece of play. Yeah, if he keeps us up. And takes us up next season, God tier. But we've not gone up yet. We've not stayed up yet. So at the moment, from based on what he's done for the first seven months, good. I think he's going to be in the good tier if he goes up for me. Simply because, like, look at the ones we've got. Look at the two Tonys we've got in there. Yeah. So what's Tony Wannington done? League Cup, UEFA Cup. You yeah. know, same with um, what's it? Pulis, pretty much the same. Like FA Cup final, just missed yeah. out. Um, you know, Europa League. If he can, if he can win us the trophy, God tier, hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah. Um, from what O'Neill's done in these first six, seven months, he's been in charge, absolutely outstanding. You know, I think going into Barnsley, I think I predicted a loss at Barnsley. I genuinely I think a, I predicted a I loss. I predicted at a nil-nil draw when I went up there. I predicted a nil-nil. I predict. I think I might have predicted a loss in the intro. The only game we've been absolutely dreadful in was maybe Middlesbrough or yeah. Derby. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think Derby was an interesting look one. At, we played time at left back mm, and it the, wasn't really the sort of first 11. No, if you look at the losses we've had, you know, Cardiff, yeah, it's, you know, Cardiff are a good we had some We had some chances in that game, but... Um, just failed to put just end product. Really yeah, uh, then we lost to Blackburn. Yeah, a bit of a poor game. Mm, yeah, I agree uh, with that. Then we lost to um, Hull. Yeah, awful. But if you look that at was just, wins, that was just Bowen Grzycki. That was just Bowen Grzycki. They're just a two man team. Yeah, as soon as they just but... went that went away, we demolished them. Yeah, I think um, what O'Neill's done. He's got a forty three. Uh, 0.48 win percentage and if you look at some of the games we've had you know look at Sheffield Wednesday look at Wigan look at Huddersfield look at West Brom you know some of these great games we've had I don't think we'd have done them under other managers the only get oh another one for the poor game I think I'd have gone for QPR but we come out of the blocks flying that game and yeah. we threw it away had we've kept had we've held on that game I think we'd been fine um but if you look at the table when he took over to where we are now, he, he's very, very done wonders already. And that's without his squad. Without it even being his squad. Brought in some great players like Tashino Kabu. Took him a while to get going at the whole game, but, you know, it's his first professional appearance. You can see the like, potential in him, can't you? Oh, 100%. He created that goal for Powell on his own. Um, and then Thompson's another one. Thompson, some of his uh, set play deliveries have been excellent they, they, and then he's Chester. got quite a couple of assists from him 
or at least pre-assists. Uh, and yeah. then Chester, not 100% sold. Divide opinion sold. again. Not 100% sold, but irons out those little mistakes he makes. And I think you've got one of the best centre-halves in the league. Put him in Bars at centre-back or him in him and Shaw Shaw Cross, Cross. if he comes back. Put Ch- uh, Collins in there as well. You've got, got a great back line there. Get, yeah. get that left back sorted. They, they all, if all four of them perform, then that's easily like the best sort of centre halves in the whole championship. Um, like in terms of a pairs, like you know. Yeah, and then once you've got that left back sorted, right there's your defence. Midfield's fine, yeah. and attack's fine. It's literally just the left back we need. I would, I would get a left back. I, I'm divided on whether to keep Ward or not because. Good experience. Because Ward's got good experience and he'd be good to have around the camp. Yeah. And I'd be divided to keep him as a left back at left back who plays literally two league games a year. Yeah. I think so get the left back sorted and then you've got Ward and the other one who has we have to get it right this time. Edwards and Smith, brilliant. Yeah. Bart, Shawcross, Chester, Collins, yeah. excellent. The midfield our midfield's fine already. We don't really need to tweak that. No. Campbell, maybe another striker. Just what? a backup one who can come on and maybe get you a goal. Vokes. Vokes, every time Vokes he comes on. Like, I would, I know, I would I know. Vokes up there. The, the thing, when Vokes starts, everyone looks at the line-up and there's like, oh, Vokes is playing. But he scores. And what's a striker's job? Yeah. What's a striker's ul- goals. Yeah. ultimately the job is to score goals? So I, I think, I think Gregors will be off in the summer. I think I'm not convinced by Gregory just yet. I think he'll go on loan in the summer. So he tells me he'll go on loan in the summer and then that'll just get moved into a permanent one. I like Cardiff might be a good place for him mm, because of the old manager link with Millwall. I wouldn't have a phobia back. No. I, I think I've, a phobia better than Bristol. I've my mind up on that one. I wouldn't have him back. Um, then you look into the academy and you've got Mo Sanko. Who, yeah. Look at some of the clubs who want Mo Sanko. I genuinely... When he turned 17... Uh, it's start to include him into the first team. Put him start to put him into the first team picture. Yeah, I mean definitely. we have to. Um, but yeah, O'Neill, good so far based on what we've seen. Yeah. Based on what we've seen, good. If he keeps it up, yeah, definitely. I mean, hopefully he doesn't turn into Hughes where um, we put him in good so far and then he's an awful yeah. when he's left. Um, but yeah, that sort of wraps it up now. Um, I am absolutely knackered. Um, <laughs> I've had. Should we talk about Johan Boskamp? Or... <laughs> hey. oh, um, you don't know Johan Boskamp? No, we're we're done now. I, I, I've heard the name, um, but a bit young to remember. Um, but yeah, I am absolutely shattered, mate. Um, yeah, bit fair of, enough. Been trying to sort other videos out. Uh, I know you've had a look at the intro for one of them. Um, yeah, just needs a bit of a tweak, but uh, but yeah. Thank you guys very much for uh, tuning in to episode six, I want to say, of the Hobby SFC podcast. Again, massive thanks to Elliot for giving up his time again uh, for, and coming on. Um, it's very much appreciated you coming on. And uh, it might you. be the last podcast for a while. I'm not 100% sure. It depends what happens with the season. Uh, if we get a decision in the next week or so, um, I'll, 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 yeah. We'll we'll know when there's a decision being made. I'm just basically just waiting for that decision to be made. Then I can go fly with go go fly with content. Yeah, time for bed. Uh, anyway, hope you guys have enjoyed. Um, uh, subscribe if you are new around here. Drop a like if you've enjoyed as well. Don't forget to follow us on our social medias. They will be in the description. And uh, yeah, massive thank you again to Elliot for coming on. Any final words? You're welcome, mate. Any final words? Uh, let's do it together. Should we do it together? Three. Two, one. Two. Go on, Stoke. Go on, Stoke. Oh, that's definitely not synced in the editing, but we can we can work with it. But yeah, thank you very much yeah. for watching. Go on, Stoke.